Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Vince Poor. I think most of you know me, but I'm the Dean of Engineering here at Princeton, and I'm really happy today to welcome Mark Jung, uh, who will be the first speaker in this year's series on uh, leadership in a technological world. Uh, this series, as many of you know, is sponsored by the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. And I think this is probably the first time we've announced it as the Keller, one of these as being sponsored by the Keller Center. Uh, the Keller Center uh, in its first, uh, was first founded about four years ago as the Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. Uh, and through the generosity of uh, Dennis and Connie Keller, uh, Dennis is a, a Princeton graduate, a, alumnus and a, and a big friend of uh, Princeton Engineering. Uh, we've uh, now been able to endow the center and it's been renamed as the Keller Center. Now the Keller Center's main goal is to educate uh, leaders, of both engineers and others, uh, for a technological world. So it's a fairly simple goal. And one of, the, one of the ways that we do this is to expose students to, to leaders. And today's speaker is, is one such. So we, this series is a uh, one of two series that we have, one is on entrepreneurship and one is on leadership, uh, in which uh, leaders from technological enterprises come and, and tell students about uh, their experiences. Uh, another uh, one of the center's main activities in this area is uh, to expose students to leadership opportunities through internships. We have uh, an internship series in which students can uh, go to a company in the summer uh, spend time with the CEO, maybe just holding the briefcase, uh, but seeing what it takes to, to lead a, a technological company and, and the kinds of decisions that have to be made and so forth. So, um, you know, this lecture series, as I said, is, is an opportunity for students to be exposed to, to leaders in a technological world, and, and today's uh, speaker is no exception. We're very happy that Mark is here. Uh, he's a very good example of the kind of leader that uh, students we'd like our students to emulate. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, uh, primarily in the area of new media, meaning primarily web-based media. Uh, he was an active participant and a developer of a wide range of companies, perhaps most notably, he was co-founder and CEO of IGN Entertainment, which was a leading internet media, which is a leading internet media and services company in video gaming and related areas. Uh, he took uh, IGN public, then he took it private again. Uh, then it was ultimately sold to News Corp, uh, where Mark assumed the role of Chief Operating Officer of Fox Interactive Media. Uh, most recently, Mark has also served as uh, CEO of Voodoo, not the religion, but uh, <laughs> the uh, media company. It's a leading provider of digital home entertainment and interactive television services. Uh, Mark is also chairman of the board of Songbird, which is, my understanding, is developing um, uh, an open source online music uh, program, I guess, for use uh, on the web. Uh, he's also a member of the board of directors of 3PAR, uh, and the list is very long, so I'll try to bri brief it a little bit here so uh, I don't take all your time. He's on the managing board of Stanford Graduate School of Business, uh, as well as a member of the board of governors of the San Francisco Symphony. Uh, of course, uh, with that kind of portfolio, uh, uh, Mark is a Princeton graduate. He's an electrical engineering graduate at Princeton. He also has an MBA from Stanford Business School. Uh, today he's going to talk about uh, something he knows very well, which is the entrepreneurial career. So Mark, I really appreciate you being here today. I look forward to what you have to say. So please Great. join me. In Thank you. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank and to everyone on the Princeton staff for the invitation to come to speak. Um, you know, as walking over here, I realized that uh, it just seems like yesterday that I was trudging over here through the snow from Holder Hall for a class at the Equad. And um, I think my priorities back then were trying to get out of 8 o'clock classes because it was, it was a long hike for 8 a.m. Um, but, you know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. You know, when I was a freshman or sophomore, I was an engineer. I did know at a high level that I wanted to have impact. 
I mean, that was something that was really important. I wanted to try to change the status quo through technological innovation. If you had asked me another question, which was, what is exactly does that mean, Mark? I'm not sure. But I knew I wanted to do something. I mean, here I was an engineer, and I wanted to go out, change the world, do something. Uh, you know, as it turned out, I personally chose a career uh, of being an entrepreneur. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm really honored today to come back and speak and try to share with you what that's meant. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I can part on you is what does that mean from a personal experience? If any of you end up being entrepreneurs, which I hope you will be, what do you have in store for yourself? And what does that journey look like? Uh, entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is a profession. You know, it's a, it's a career choice. It's a vocation. You know, when I hear the phrase leadership in a technological world, I actually think of entrepreneurship because to me they mean one and the same. It's hard for me to separate the difference between technological innovation and leadership and entrepreneurship overall. Entrepreneurship involves a personal willingness to take on a huge amount of initiative and risk. And then you're doing this in the pursuit of innovation and the goal, of course, is to change the world or actually to change the way things are being done in the world as you see it. You know, when I think about the technology industry, I think about Microsoft, I think about Cisco, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Apple, Google, Facebook, all phenomenal successes in their own right. All companies that were started by entrepreneurs, by individuals that had a singular vision of wanting to change the world. They all started as a tiny company by an entrepreneur, and look how large they are today. You know, ironically, <laughs> when I think back upon grade school and go back to when you were in grade school, we used to be asked, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you invariably the list would be quite long. They would be doctor, um, musician, uh, fireman, scientist, lawyer, professor, maybe even president, or with a real stretch, superhero. But never entrepreneur. You know, that name never came up. That term wasn't even in our vocabulary at that age. Uh, but times have changed. I can tell you today students are starting companies before they finish college, or rather, they're dropping out of college and then starting companies. Uh, so I think it would be safe to say that as we move into 2009, entrepreneurship has certainly risen to the ranks of being a bona fide career choice, a true profession. And from everything that I've seen nationwide and worldwide, it's becoming an increasingly popular profession for the young adults. So what defines an entrepreneur anyways? You know, I put some thought into this, and I would describe it as probably part evangelist, part problem solver, part jack of all trades. You know, throwing a touch of maverick, throwing a touch of iconoclast, there you have it. You're a visionary in your own right. You're off on your next crusade. But do you have it, what it takes to be an entrepreneur? What, what exactly is it? What is the DNA? Well, courage and conviction come to mind, as does creativity open-mindedness, self-confidence and self-reliance, let alone intelligence. Persistence is really critical, um, even if it's accompanied by stubbornness. And many of us are quite stubborn, as I'm sure you can imagine. But most of all, you need to be decisive. The ability to form opinions, make educated guesses, and have a heavy bias for action is really, really important. You know, in in the world out there, in, in marketplaces, windows of opportunity open for quite a while, and then they close. Uh, successful entrepreneurs recognize the windows. They capitalize on those windows quickly and early. And they go on to build leadership positions. Because being number one and being a first mover is really, really important if you want to build a large, sustaining organization. Most entrepreneurs I know play to win. There are zero points for coming in second place. That doesn't mean that if you lose, the game is over, because successful entrepreneurs tend to be serial entrepreneurs, meaning that they learn from the mistakes as they go forward. In fact, you rarely hear about companies that fail when you talk among entrepreneurs. Um, it's all about the company that succeeds. I mean, as in society, within our profession entrepreneurship, we tend to gravitate towards stories of the big fish that's caught. No one mentions the thousands that are thrown back in the sea. And in fact, if you think about it, one implication of this means that as an entrepreneur, the journey is far more important than the end result. Because you're going to get several bites at the apple. 
And the question really you have to ask yourself is, what are you learning about yourself throughout the process? How would you define personal growth as an entrepreneur? Are you able to learn from your mistakes? I would hope so, because you're going to make a lot of mistakes as an entrepreneur. You're going to continue to make mistakes. I continue to make mistakes today, 30 years after entering Princeton. But hopefully, I don't make the same mistake twice. And that's really important. A career in entrepreneurship is truly unique, because there is no stigma associated with failure. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Failure is a necessary learning process in a profession that, in many ways, can't be solely taught. It can't be learned completely and only in the classroom. There's got to be an empirical component of it. One way to describe an entrepreneurial career would be to characterize it as one long and continuous lab experiment. I mean, ironically, even leading business schools across the country today are beginning to realize this. The tools that can be taught in the classroom may be necessary, but not sufficient. Um, you can tell, for example, let me give you an example. You can tell a three-year-old not to touch a burning stove. You can explain to them the physics, the rationale of what makes a stove hot. In fact, you can point to when a stove is hot and when a stove is cold for a three-year-old. But at the end of the day, there is no amount of instruction you can give that child that's going to compensate for him touching the stove and going through the experience of getting burned. Because that experience is the only real experience of learning for him. Because everything else is, in his mind, with all due respect, a big academic. Right? You're telling me it's hot. I don't know what hot means. I have to touch it. Now I know what hot is. Now I know I won't touch it again. And that analogy is important. Because as an entrepreneur, you have to do it. You can learn, you can prepare, you can bring tools with you. But there is really only one way to find out, and that is to get in there and start that initiative or that venture and learn from it. Um, what I thought I would do next for the remainder of my talk, and then we can open for questions, is literally discuss a few examples of uh, personal challenges that you'll likely encounter if you choose a career in entrepreneurship. And I've organized the examples in a linear fashion, kind of tying to the typical life cycle of a startup from inception to maturity. Uh, I'll use IGM, which was one of the companies I was involved with that I founded as a case and example, because I think it'll help you understand behind the scenes what goes on when you start a company as a CEO and what challenges do you face. So let's start with the easiest phase. The easiest phase is inception. I mean, this is an unbelievable time, right? Unbridled enthusiasm, unbridled passion. The future is all ahead of you. Nothing has gone wrong. How could anything have gone wrong yet? You haven't started, right? So it's perfect. Uh, in fact, it's very much like orientation week for freshmen in freshman year, if I recall. And then you'll be making some critical decisions. Business planning, name of the company, uh, you know, the strategy, logistics. But there is one decision that stands out far above and beyond all the other decisions, quite often a decision that very few entrepreneurs take the time to think hard about. And that is, who's the team you're going to surround yourself with at the start, at the beginning? Now. You go out and ask a lot of people, you're going to get a lot of advice, right? Invariably, it comes back down to go with the A team. Oh, that's really helpful. OK, the A team. Well, look around you. I mean, I'm looking around this room. I mean, we are at Princeton University. This is the A team right here. So does that mean that each of you, look at the people next to you, should start a company with the three people sitting in your same row? Because I guarantee you, they're all part of the A team. They're bright. They're intelligent. They bring a huge amount. They're at Princeton. Well. I thought the question really is, is it going to work? Well, I'm, what, what another analogy can I use? Well, the A team tends to room with each other at Princeton as well. Just because freshman year begins with four students in a dorm room, it doesn't mean it deteriorates within three months. Right? It starts off, hey, I'm from Atlanta. I'm from California. I'm from New York. Three months later, is that's my sweatshirt. No, that's my orange juice. Or even worse, it goes to silence where you avoid each other. And then you're talking to the RA, and you're asking for a transfer. So things. Bad things can happen, even among smart people. And this is a really important thing, because no one sits down and says, what is the culture we're going to build? And do you and I, do we as a team, share a common value structure? I mean, take, do you sit down and talk about the goals of, hey, other than the first week of excitement, what happens two years from now? How long are you going to be with me? Let's talk about success. How do we define success? If you define success as, I'm going to make, as soon as I make a million dollars, I'm out of here, and I'm going to go fishing, that may be not my goal. You know, I may not be interested in money. Does that mean you're going to leave me when you hit your goal? But that wasn't our goal. Or maybe that wasn't my goal. Or what is our goal? 
Well, no one ever talks about our goal. They just go headstrong into it with a bunch of friends from college, and there you go, and you're off and running, which is great when the roommate situation is perfect, but it is a disaster when things break down. Um, you really need to think about codependence. This is much more like a mountaineering expedition. Who is on the other side of that rope? Because when things get tough halfway up that mountain, who is holding the other side of the rope? And are they going to be there? Or are they going to say, you know what, I quit. I don't, I don't really want to do this. This isn't fun anymore. Um, these are the questions you have to ask yourself. And I encourage you to ask this of your teammates early, early at the beginning of the onset. Now, what happens if there's a breakup of the team? Let's try another analogy. In the social world, you know, divorce typically ends a marriage. Well, rarely is divorce a topic discussed during the wedding planning phases of a couple that's in love and that's engaged. But a divorce rarely ends a company. A divorce between founders rarely ends a company. It simply means one leaves, and the company still exists. And then bigger problems exist because there's still continuity of the entity. You just can't split your own ways, shut everything down, and pretend nothing happened. So I can only encourage you again, get advice in this area. Now, what advice can you get? You can't get advice from your friends. Um, they may not be uh, objective. In fact, if you start a company with friends, that's another topic in of itself. But you need to be prepared and think through the decision. If you said, well, my best friend and I are starting a company together, what happens if it doesn't work out? What's more important, your friendship or the company? Or what if one of you ends up working for the other? Are you going to be strong enough to tell that person the true story? They're not doing a good job. Or are you going to look the other way because he or she's your friend? I mean, these are interesting questions that I, 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 I can tell you from personal experience. And when I was younger, I didn't ask. Because no one ever told me to ask. I just found out the hard way. When you find out the hard way, it's painful. So again, in phase one during this inception, I would get a lawyer. Or get a lawyer to help you. Because lawyers tend, with all due respect, to focus on the negatives in order to protect you. They'll take a look at this bottle and they'll say, this bottle is half empty, not half full. And I guarantee you, when you start a company, you'll be saying this, this bottle is half full. I could dump all the water out on the ground. You'll still say this bottle is half full when you're starting your company because you're just excited. But there are people who will say, what if it isn't half full? What if it's half empty? Let's protect you on the downside. Even the one in 100 occurrence that it's going to happen, I'm going to protect you. And you need that help. OK, let's move on to the next phase. Assume your company starts to grow and you're successful. You get into this very exciting phase, which is growth. Growth is very interesting because it can accelerate at a quite a rapid pace. And among all the challenges that you're going to have, systems, processes, or otherwise, you're going to have one typical challenge as an entrepreneur or as a founder, and that's dissemination of information. You know, you can go to business school and hear all these things about autonomy and discretion and authority and organizational behavior um, and who's empowered with what jobs and what titles, and that's all really interesting. And we could talk about that for hours, but I could tell you that in my opinion, the big issue is that you know more than anyone else because you started the company. The vision is locked in your head. You have a vision for how you're going to change the world, why this technology is so much more competitive than anything else, and all of the byproducts and all the things that could come of it. You're the company's best salesperson. You're the company's best spokesperson. You're the leader. And that's great when there's 15 people and you can give that speech through osmosis at the water cooler every morning. But when you're adding two, three, I mean, in my space, we were adding six people a day. When you add that many people that quickly, it is impossible for them to articulate what the vision of the company is. And even if you sit down with them, you're going to have to sit down with them seven times because they don't have that fire from inside. They came there because of you. But when they come there because of you and they expect to learn from you, you must impart that vision to them. That means you have to have a knowledge transfer. You become a professor. And you must do that because your company is scaling at such a rapid rate. What if you get sick? What if you take a vacation? You can't, the company can't be dependent upon you. So, I can, so a really critical task here, you're not going to read it in a book, is figuring out how's the best way that I can package what's inside of me and train trainers and get that information out there so teams can be independent, that they can go out close a customer, they can close a business development deal in New York. They can recruit, they can come to Princeton and recruit 12 employees and explain to the 12 seniors who are applying for a job what the company does and why we're going to be successful so you, the CEO, don't have to go visit Princeton, Harvard, Yale, and every other school across the country. Okay. 
third phase. The third phase is the ugliest. Um, I'd like to say that most companies won't go through it, but most companies do go through it. And this phase is called a setback. And it's almost completely relevant to today, ironically, if you go to Silicon Valley, where I've spent most of my last 25 years, it's getting pretty ugly out there in terms of setback. Ever since the Sequoia memo went out about rest in peace, people are being laid off right and left. Every company, it's almost as you're unpopular if your company doesn't lay off employees. And so it's a pullback. And this is a really difficult time for you because your whole life has been vision, excitement, recruiting, positive growth. And suddenly you're faced with contraction. Now what kinds of bad things? To give you an example of what happened at IGN, how bad the setback was. We went public in 2000. We hit a market cap of a billion dollars five minutes after I spoke on CNBC. Our stock dropped from $1 billion in market cap to $1 million in market cap in less than two years. We dropped three orders of magnitude. And for those of you who are engineers in this room, you certainly know what three orders of magnitude on the decimal point means. We probably won the award. That implosion is really an ugly process to go through. You have to cut costs. We cut costs through a series of five layoffs from 500 employees down to 50 people. Uh, that's a lot of layoffs. Now, I will say this much as you go through layoffs. There is no greater test of self-belief um, than when you realize that you're failing. Right? Your company is failing. You have to let go people who you recruited. Right? You sold them on a vision. You took them out of their lives. Maybe they were working for a large company with a salary. And you told them to take a lower salary and stock options for this vision. We're the next Facebook. We're the whatever. And you're going back to them later and saying, I was wrong. And it's even worse. You can't stay on the boat because the boat is sinking. And they're asking, well, wh why did you choose me? Why don't you choose my neighbor? Last time I looked, so you didn't shut the company down. There's still 250 people here. Why am I in the have-nots versus the have? There is no answer for this, but I can tell you it is such an ugly process. It's something you need to prepare yourself for. Every startup executive goes through this. Yahoo's laying off 5,000 people right now. Google just announced a hiring freeze, which means they're going to shrink a bit. So it's just happening. It goes through the cycles of the marketplace, and it's inevitable. You invest when there's opportunity, and you have to contract when times get difficult. And so it's going to be a tough process. Um, I don't have much to tell you about this. I will say that try to look for humor in your job on a day-to-day -day basis. There's not much to laugh about, although I could tell you some stories that you might find funny. Got so bad that um, you become persona non grata. You know, there were days where I, I swear you, you'd walk down the corridor and you'd imagine there are like red crosses painted on the queue posts from people who are saying, "Not my queue, please. Here he comes. Not my queue." Right? People won't establish eye contact. It's like walking on a south. I'm going to be flown Southwest Airlines. This is the most amazing thing in social behavior. If you're in the C group or whatever, and you get on a Southwest Airlines flight and all there are middle seats left, and you walk down the aisle, all these people in conversation suddenly are like this. <laughs> They're like reading the article in GM for the ninth time. And you walk up to them, and there's a gentleman there, and I, you, know, you go up to them and you say, excuse me, sir, someone's sitting there. And it's always this. Are you talking to me? Like, you've been watching me for the last 35 feet. Don't give me this. Are you talking to me? Is this seat? You mean, is there someone sitting here? Yeah, well, I don't see any other seat. Yeah, the seat right next to you. Right? It's this human behavior. Okay, if I don't look at him, he's going to walk by my seat and take the seat next. So when you're the CEO and you walk through your company, people are only thinking one thing. Well, there have been three layoffs, and here he comes again. So if it's you or the VP of HR, it's like, just keep your face down in your cube, keep your fingers crossed, and they'll walk by my cube. One day I, uh, I called a meeting, and it was in the spring, and I have allergies, so uh, I have hay fever. So I made the colossal mistake of bringing a box of Kleenex into the room. <laughs> and I was, was early to this meeting. It was a conference room. It was a product planning meeting with about five people and myself. So I sat down, and I had my papers here in front of me, and I put my box of Kleenex there to look at my watch. No one was coming in. They were all outside the conference room, and then they all came in together. And they all came in, and they, it's like a funeral. They're standing solemnly against the wall. Here's Mark, I'm clueless. So I'm thinking, 
please sit down. No one would sit down. I'm like, no, please, have a seat. What are we going to do, this meeting standing up? And uh, one of the women said, you know, Mark, please, we'd prefer to do this standing up. <laughs> I'm thinking, prefer to do what? Product planning me? <laughs> and they're all looking at this Kleenex box. I'm like, hello, big fly, right? I grab the Kleenex box. I'm like, this is for me. One guy goes, Phew. we thought we were goners. That was so close, right? <laughs> So, let me tell you, get prepared. It's not pretty, but it's an experience that you have to go through. I will say this much, it becomes a real test of your own personal compass, right? Your own self-faith. You're gonna look at mirror, in a mirror when you go home at night and you're gonna ask yourself, do you still believe? Do you still believe in the company? Are you doing the right thing? You lay people off, you've got a smaller company. You're still seeing the glass half full. Are you being fair to the employees who are still there? Or are you in denial? Is your company not going to make it? And you're just extending the inevitable for them. And you know, that's a huge burden for you to carry on your shoulders. And it's something that I can't help you with either. It's a personal experience that each of you will have to go through. There are times where, no, you should shut the company down. And there are times where, no, you're going to make it. You're going to throw enough weight off of the plane so it levels off, and you're actually going to sail through. But I do encourage you during that phase, you need someone to talk to. Roughly not a psychiatrist, but a mentor. And it can't be someone in the company. It's got to be someone you trust. Someone that you can use as a sounding board, because it's gonna, you can't keep this all within. It's just too difficult a burden, a weight on your shoulders. And I encourage you again, find someone. Industry executive, coach, friend, could be a family member, uh, to be your mentor. Okay, what happens after that? If you make it through, and for those companies that make it through this implosion over the next two years, it's a great time. Because what happens, you know, that plane kind of levels off, right? You're falling, you're throwing sand out of the plane, and the plane is like, you know, guys, we're not going to make it. And then suddenly, the plane doesn't drop anymore. You might be close to the top of the mountains, but the plane levels off. And then it starts that slow climb back upwards. And there's this applause, you know, a, a, a huge amount of excitement in the company a rejuvenation, which is we made it. We made it through the storm. The storm is cleared. We're safe. But you're not quite sure because anything could happen. And so there's an intense focus by the organization to capture everything you can and to be as successful as you can, lest the storm return. And so you start focusing on metrics. You measure every <laughs> single piece of progress, every single dollar of revenue, every single user that comes to your website, every single R&D accomplishment is earmarked, measured, marked, broadcast, bells ringing, and the company that's that focused it does really well. And typically, since you have less competition coming out of the setback because the weak didn't make it, you start to pick up market share and you grow at a rapid rate. In fact, you may grow so rapidly, as we did with IGN, that it's going to surprise even you as the entrepreneur or the founder. I mean, we grew significantly in just a short nine-month window after the dot-com pullback in the early 2000s. But now you're going to be faced with another challenge. Now, this challenge is an extremely difficult challenge. It's an ethical challenge for yourself, which is you'll suddenly realize, wait, we're a bigger company now. And some of my teammates and executives aren't capable of doing their jobs anymore because we're bigger, and they're startup people. They were great holding the fort down. You paired the company back. They were the survivors. They were your most loyal inner, inner circle. They fought with you to the end. They're great startup people. They're great entrepreneurs. They're awful managers. I'm getting feedback. I don't want to work for that person. They don't put in discipline. They have 20 people working in their department, and a mutiny is about to occur. And yet they're so loyal to you. And then what do you do? Your best friends, your most loyal officers, and you're looking at them thinking, you know what? You can't be here anymore. You can't be in this position. And that's your job as the CEO. You have to choose between the company and them. And this is a really difficult task. But at the end of the day, you have to make the right decision. You've got to find another role for them, or they need to move on, or the company will be held back because of that. And uh, again, it's not a pretty task. It's a challenge you'll face as an entrepreneur. It's an organizational and a personal and an ethical challenge. But someone's got to talk about it. And I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to deal with this as well. Not a pretty situation, but something to prepare yourself for. OK, the last thing that could possibly occur 
assuming the company gets to a state, whatever state that is that you've defined in your original set of goals, where it's time for you to move on. And that could be for a wide variety of reasons. You want to retire, or you get promoted. In the case where uh, we sold IGN to Fox, I got promoted to run MySpace and American Idol and Fox Sports and the other properties, which is good news perhaps for me, but perhaps bad news for the organization because you're being pulled out from the organization that you founded. And understand that as an entrepreneur, you set the culture and the vision of a company. And even at three, four, five hundred people, it's still very much driven by you and the personality of you. And when you're extracted from that situation, there is a, there's a letdown. There will be people there who came there for you. And they're going to call you or they're going to email you and say, take me with you, because that's why I came here. And then you're going to think, well, if I take you with me, I'm going to hurt the asset I'm leaving behind. If you leave a company, what are you going to do? Raid it and take all the people with you selfishly, but you destroy the legacy of what you built, which is yet another ethical decision you're going to have to make because people are going to say, I don't understand why you don't take me with you, why you aren't answering my calls. I sent you three emails that said, I'll come work with you. I'll work with you everywhere, anywhere, in any job. Please take me with you. And where does loyalty sit? I don't have an answer for you on this one either, but I could tell you my answer is you're going to have to deal with this as well. So these are examples of what I call challenges that you'll face as an entrepreneur. These are not problem-solving challenges in the technical sense of academic problem-solving. These aren't, you know, plug the answer into a computer model and run the analysis. These are personal challenges that you're going to have to face uh, if you choose this path. And we can talk more about this, but uh, I want to make sure that everyone thinks about this in advance, um, that, because if you choose this career, you're going to have to make these difficult decisions. Okay, um, let me try to, try to summarize here. Um, I've tried to give you a perspective of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I've tried to highlight some of the most difficult and challenging issues, decisions that each of you will face if you choose this as a career path. And you know, really, that was my only goal for the speech today, which is to provide you with some food for thought, you know, notes against which you can run your own comparisons, not meant to be really a guidebook of what to do or what not to do. Because the only person who really can answer that question is you. Right? Each of you will make your own mistakes. You'll be better off for it if you choose a career in entrepreneurship. You know, by definition, as I look around the room, each of you has been blessed with an unbelievable set of talent. The collective talent um, in this room alone uh, is quite impressive. And I can only encourage you to leverage this talent. And don't let it sit idle. You know, if you opt for a path of entrepreneurship, you will leverage these talents, and I guarantee you, you'll go on and do amazing things. You know, you'll take on risk, you'll innovate, you'll surprise even yourself of what you're capable of. Um, and you'll have impact, probably more than if you were to write down right now how you want to impact or change the world. Um, and then you look back 20 or 30 years from now, I think you'll be surprised as to what you can allow yourself to do if you choose this independent path. Only one last piece of advice, and I say this when I speak at different universities because I'm seeing a disturbing trend, and that is please get your degree first. Don't, don't, just because companies like Facebook or Microsoft or Apple um, or Oracle were started by <laughs> executives didn't quite finish their education, that doesn't mean that, you, that the value of the degree isn't important. I strongly encourage you, stay, get your degree, pursue your path of entrepreneurship. When you're successful, don't forget about Princeton, come back and speak, and we'll go from there. Thank you. You know, the questions about the ugly face, the contraction face, and what you can do to avoid. Can you be smarter 
with experience in planning in advance and not make the mistakes. You know, I think one of the fundamental quandaries you have as a technology executive is when you see an opportunity, you have to take it. You have to move quickly. And so there is a tendency to invest and invest rapidly to gain share. So when times are good, you don't sit back and think about, oh, around the corner, the market's going to crash, so I just won't spend. You double down, you triple down. You hire, like Google, 8,000 engineers. You invest because you snooze, you lose in technology. These days, technological innovation is moving so quickly. The tools that can facilitate the, pa the pace of innovation have improved the systems. I mean, look at, it's almost, look at the semiconductor industry is a great example. The pace of innovation, the second derivative is moving. And so because of that, when times are good, which always precedes when times are bad, and it's usually directly correlated, you're investing. You're investing heavily. You're, you're investing in R&D. You're investing in customer acquisition. You're building market share. You're building brand. You're, you're, you're signing up more customers. You're adding more employees. You're taking the top talent out of Princeton and Harvard. And then when the wall hits, not only do you have to shut down the growth, you have to replan the entire business model, and you may realize you have too much cost. So the question would be, well, why did your business plan say the world was going to be so rosy? Well, how could you know? If everyone knew that the marketplace would crash in the month of October and November on the NYSE, they would have made a lot of money, right? But not everyone did. I mean, whether you trust them or not, I mean, even Chairman Lehman on an earnings conference call two weeks before, or days before the company went under, said we're fully reserved. And so you, know, you could argue that's an extreme case. But it's really hard to see. It's really hard to predict when the markets collapse. And it's really hard to exercise the discipline to say, I don't want to invest when times are good, so I don't build up a cost structure that I have to reduce when times are bad. And you know, even though I've been through this so many times, I wouldn't do anything differently. If you've ever been a race car driver, or even an amateur race car driver on a track, I could tell you in the straightaway, you accelerate. You accelerate from 40 to 130, even as you come towards the next curve. And then you slam the brakes on so that you can stay in control of the next curve. You may come down to 35 miles per hour as you go through a hairpin, and then you accelerate as fast as possible. So you're burning through your brakes unnecessarily, and you're using up fuel unnecessarily for the maximum acceleration and the maximum deceleration. And that analogy occurs in almost every technology company I know. When times are good, you put the foot to the floor. And when times are bad, you slam the brakes as fast as possible. Because if you just cruise at 30 miles per hour, you'll never be number one, ever. <laughs> That's my opinion. There's another question, Ryan. Um, I'm a senior, and I'm starting up a company right now. And because of that, I haven't applied to any jobs. I've been too busy trying to build my team. Uh, my mom says, though, I should really be applying to jobs, <laughs> and especially given, you know, just how bad things are these days. Uh, you know, for our family as well, I should really be making sure I have some sort of security uh, when school's over. Um, what, what do you think about that? Like, and also, if I, if I do apply to jobs, I was thinking of maybe applying to venture capital firms or, or startup companies, or, you know, what's the most relevant way to go, assuming I do want to be an entrepreneur? Well, I would I'd certainly apply for jobs. That doesn't mean you should accept the, uh, the offers that you get. But uh, we sh one should be so lucky if you get four or five offers and you have choice. Choice in, uh, choice in life is important. You know, I certainly don't recommend any high school senior today to apply to only one college. Uh, well, I guess maybe uh, unless it's early decision, because choice is important and it's getting more competitive last time I looked. So uh, it's hard, I think, for you to say to yourself, where your mind will be 12 months from now. You might go into a startup initiative in your mind, in that planning phase, and every day you wake up, you're getting more and more excited. And the determination is increasing, and your conviction is increasing, and nothing's going to get in the way, not even your mother. And that's more power to you. Or you might wake up one day and decide, I'm not ready for this. You know, I, I didn't start my first company till I was 27. So I'm not an example like Mark Zuckerberg, who dropped out in 19 to start Facebook. Um, I was an old person starting a company at 27. I wasn't ready before I was 27. Um, I fell in love with it from that point forward, but I think each of you is going to have your own internal clock. And there's so many factors that determine it. Your own personal financial situation, you know, whether you have debt, your family situation, burdens, self-confidence, and there's no formula. So I, I don't think I can really answer that except to keep your options open. 
As it relates to the second question, which is, should you go into venture capital or the investment side as opposed to the operating side? It depends on what you want to do for a career. If you want to be involved with technology in a career, whether that's in a large company like IBM or Hewlett Packard or in a startup, whether that's in the web or in hardware or in biomedication or clean tech, I'd strongly encourage, first of all, you get operating experience, which means you go into a company. If you go in and be an investor, you're on the sidelines. And you know, to me, that's when your knee is hurt and your arm doesn't work anymore and you're on the sidelines. And I think you can be a great coach from the sidelines, but you can't be a great coach unless you've played the game. And if you haven't played the game yet, I'm not sure what value being a coach is really going to do. And so I would strongly encourage you, financial considerations aside, to go into a job, whether that's a startup, start your own company, or go work for a large company. You know, entrepreneurship can occur in a large company. I mean, there are more challenges and there are more opportunities there. There are different kinds of challenges. There are budget constraints and a wide variety, of, and there's cultural constraints. But a lot of great things come out of innovation in Google, and Google is a large company. Anything, 10,000 people is a large company, or Cisco, or Apple, um, or AT&T even. So it, it, it's not a question of is it a startup or not. It's a question of saying, you know, I have a dream, I have a vision, and I have skills that I've learned here at Princeton, and I want to apply them. I'm going to use technology to change the world, and I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a big difference. And uh, whether you're in a large company or a small company, it doesn't make a difference. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Another question back here. You know, I met with a, um, when I was younger, I met with a, a he'll go unnamed, because I think I'm being taped, the top Silicon Valley executive. Today, he runs a 10 to $20 billion public company. And he said to me, Mark, there's only three kinds of companies. You know, you either own a market, you dominate markets, or you lead a market. Otherwise, you go home. I'm like, well, what's the difference between the three? When you own a market, you're a true monopoly. Google's not a monopoly. Microsoft at the desktop operating system is a monopoly. A monopoly means no way in, no second player, relative market share, it doesn't exist. I wouldn't start a company to build an operating system for the PC right now. That's probably not a smart idea. I don't think you're going to get much venture capital funding. That is a monopoly. Market dominance is where the relative market share is so great that you have a cost advantage, you have a customer acquisition advantage, you have a brand advantage. And maybe in pure algorithmic search, for Google, you could say that. But I would place Google somewhere between market dominant and market leader. Because there's Yahoo, there's A9, there are other search engines out there right, that exist. It's just that Google has the market lead in terms of relative market share. You ask the question is, would you start a search company? I just saw four search companies in the valley, four business plans just in the last two weeks, two of them being funded by venture capitalists. Three of them founded by ex-Google employees who believe they can beat Google in certain areas. You may not be able to build a generic across-the-board large search company, but there's a lot of different ways into a market. 
in terms of how you deal with vertical search or uh, rhythmic search or, or otherwise. And so I think true entrepreneurs, when you identify an idea, the business planning phase is really important because you do have to answer very, a very simple question. It sounds like an oxymoron because it's complex. It's a simple and complex question at the same time. Why are you going to win? Please define for me why you're going to win in whatever category you're going to win in, which means you have to identify the customer and who that customer is and who you compete with and why your value proposition is so far superior to the customer that the consumers are going to adopt your solution. Right, right now, here's a great example, social networking. Here's a question for the audience. And you know, <coughs> MySpace was one of our properties. We thought we won. Hardly. Did we win? No. Look at what else is coming. So you could argue, well, between MySpace and Facebook and LinkedIn, there's no point in creating a social network. Well, you could take the other argument, which is we're in the first innings, because last time I looked, there were 25 business plans that I've seen in the Valley for new vertical social networks in sports and food, in adults, in baby care. They're, they're springing up right and left. And so the question really is, how do you answer that question? Why would you create a social network when you have to deal with Facebook? Or Facebook can't be anything to everybody, and there are huge opportunities in splinter markets. And so I, I, we could spend more time on this. I don't think in this forum, and I apologize, we're going to be able to get into the details, but the devil is in the details. It comes down to really coming clear and making sure that you narrowly define who your customer is. You should be able to describe that customer. What, is they, what do they look like? What do they feel like? Where do they live? What are they doing right now? And why are they going to switch from what they're doing right now to using your product or your service? And the reason for them to do that may not even be recession dependent. You may have a counter cyclical solution. If you're in clean tech right now, if you're there right now to reduce the world's energy consumption means, a startup is a perfect opportunity. You may have customers knocking on your door before you even produce a product, right? So recession creates as much opportunity as it closes doors on other opportunities. What recession certainly does do is it shakes things up in a huge way, which means incumbents get hurt and new ideas and innovation win. This is a best time to come out of college, the best time to come out of graduate school, the best time, in my opinion, within reason, to start companies because it's now a level playing field. I can tell you right now, for Hulu to go from where they did to market share X, for Facebook to go from where they did to their market share today in two years, proves that 100 years of media and technology development couldn't stop technical innovation from occurring in a 24-month window. And it, forget about the recession. The recession did or did not impact the reason why people use Facebook. And so again, if you have that idea, and you have this dream and you have this vision and you do your research and you realize, you know what? People are going to use this. The world needs this and no one else is doing this. I don't know why. It's like there's a $100 bill on the floor and no one's picking it up. Let's say it has a string attached to it. Pick it up and see what happens. The worst thing that could happen is someone's going to pull the string on you and you're like, I knew it. It really, wasn't, it really wasn't there. But when you see that opportunity, you need to move quickly or else someone else is going to move. I'll take one more question, yeah. What advice do you have for doing uh, financing things? Well, my first advice for doing financing pitches is never put yourself in a position where you need a huge amount of money, which means you're going to be dependent upon whomever you're speaking to, which means you're basically ceding control of your venture and your process to them, right? The best advice I can give you a financing pitch, no matter what you do, is to ask for the least amount of money as possible, which is kind of like saying, I'll take your money, but you know what? I don't really need to. Now, I talked to another executive in the Valley, this executive will certainly go unnamed, who said, yeah, I, I brought the venture capitalists into my company. I told them they could join the board, but I told them if they opened their mouth, I'd ask them to leave the room. I'm like, you said what? He said, yeah, they don't own enough to make a difference. So I don't want them controlling my company. You know, to each his own. But that's certainly my first piece of advice, which is if you create a business plan that needs a huge amount of money and you're going to give up the majority of your company to them, you're asking, they might actually think, why is this person even doing this, right? So the first thing is ask for as least amount of money as possible, which means you have to have a business plan that doesn't consume that amount of capital. So you have to think about what business doesn't consume that amount of capital. That would be my first recommendation. Second recommendation quickly is they're going to be pretty tough on you when you go in there, when you ask for money. And so you want clarity. You want to go in there with confidence and clarity. And the most important thing to be clear about is similar to the question that was asked earlier. Who is your customer? And how, why is it that you have a better solution for that customer than what exists today? Because they're doing something else today. 
if you said, well, I have a new video site and I'm going to have TV videos on it or whatever, they're going to say, well, what are those people doing right now when they're not using your product? Well, I've got a new form of energy. Well, wh what type of energy are they consuming today? Because they're going to compare the status quo to you. And then they're going to look at switching costs, which is, well, why would I use this new thing? I'm lazy. Is it going to cost me a lot of money? The switching costs are high. I don't know who you are. You might go out of business. I'm working with a big company. There, is, there isn't a compelling reason. I'm not enough pain to move across. If you can create that compelling reason and make it clear to the investor that that compelling reason and pain threshold is high enough that the consumer or the business says, you know what? I need to move. I need to move over. I need to get rid of what I'm doing. And I need to adopt your solution because it benefits me in a huge way. Once that's clear, everyone will say yes. I mean, literally, everyone will say yes when you go out and ask for capital. So that's a task and a homework assignment for you as you establish your new venture. Okay. Mark, thank you very, very much.